especially thank you for coming. Uh, I think a lot of you wouldn't know. I'm Rob Pollock is my name. I'm the Deputy Mayor. I'd like to apologise for Liz Innes who was doing at the briefings at uh, Naruma this morning and Naruma and uh, Naruma and Maruya rather and uh, Liz has probably gone back to uh, her place to make sure it's safe because she's been uh, fighting to keep that uh, her place out along run up the road uh, safe for uh, the last 10 days or thereabouts and uh, I think she's uh, run out of gas to tell you the truth. I'd also like to apologise for uh, Andrew Constance who is down at Cabargo and having driven through Cabargo a couple of days ago and I tell you they really need him down there and a lot of other things to happen too. And on behalf of the Shire, can I congratulate the Bateman's Bay community for the way it's handled itself uh, in, in terrible circumstances over the last two weeks and I think you've done a mighty job and the real thing has to be, yes, you've done a great job. Look at all of those people who are in terrible and dire straits. Let's work how we can help them. Don't ask them, don't wait for them to ask for help. You stand up and see and offer what you can do to help because there are so many people in, in terrible circumstances and we're all in a position where we can do more and as a community, that is what will set us apart. And that is going to be a very long and difficult task over the next couple of weeks in the first place while everybody gets organised and then we commence the real recovery effort, which will be of great difficulty and it will be long and it will be uh, hard for all of us. But it's what we can do as individuals and a group to make other people's life as good as we can make it. Some of us have to thank our lucky stars and those of us that have and haven't at this point suffered are in a great position to offer support to those that haven't been so lucky. The main aim of today is to bring you up to date with what we are doing as a Shire and all the other associated emergency uh, personnel, with the RFS, the SES, the uh, defence personnel which are now becoming more visible on the ground and uh, then we will throw uh, at the end to questions. Can I ask, if you have questions, please keep them to, uh, of the nature that is of use to the whole of the group here today. If you have specific individual questions, come and see us later and we'll address them, we'll make a note, and if we haven't got an answer, we'll get back to you with the answer. But please, don't ask questions here today that are specific to you or individual situations. Let's, let's see, keep it in the way that it can be of value to everybody. I'll now throw to, the, uh, to Ian from the RFS and then Warren will give you uh, uh, a rundown on what has happened from the Shire perspective. And then uh, we've got Dini over here who will uh, give you some information on the well-being of people and what uh, is available and will be made available for people that are in uh, real strife. But I'll let him uh, outline that when he gets a chance. So, uh, Ian, if you'd like to uh, go for your life. Good afternoon, everyone. My name's Ian Aiken. I'm the captain of Bakers Bay Royal Fire Brigade. Uh, I'm here representing the RFS. Um, Angus Barnes couldn't be here today, the OC. He's got uh, challenging uh, duties down in Maria and, and beyond. Uh, most of the large part of the fire is now obviously travelling towards the south. Uh, I'm just going to read you. Has everyone got this form? Yeah. So I'm just going to briefly go over it. Um, as I said, the large amounts of uh, uncontained fire between Bakers Bay and the Victorian border. Mainly the uh, Clyde Mound, north in the north, and Kundela and Badge of Forest Fires in the south. Now those two fires have actually joined now. I know they're separate on the map, but they have actually joined. Okay? So that's probably that's the best we could receive in any of the line stands in the last couple of days that we've had in other areas. So that's why some parts of the map may not indicate burnt areas, which I'll, I'll indicate to you if you don't part of it in, that's fine. Okay. So, the bomb has predicted a return of 
warm and windy weather, uh, hot dry north westerly winds will affect uh, again parts of the, uh, the fire ground despite some recent patchy rain, we had a little bit of rain in the north as well. Um, within several hours that will dry out and it's already dried out I think. Um, probably going to get a southerly change on Friday night, they're saying about midnight. It's going to be warm and wind, hot and windy weather on Friday. So the force cast conditions will increase fire behaviour and lead to, lead to challenging conditions for firefighters and the community. A clear priority for the New South Wales RFS will always be the protection of life and property. Now, number one priority is I'm, I'm a firefighter, and the number one priority is my crew. If I feel it's not safe for them to go in there, I won't take them in there. So people who are in remote areas in the Shire, in this area of the Shire, if you are remote and you're still in you feel you're still prone to uh, fire activity, please try to either be completely defensible or remove yourself from there altogether to a safer location because it's really difficult under those conditions to try to come and protect you. Um, one of the areas that uh, was affected the other day, I think you noticed on there, the Wicky Walker Road's not uh, marked as a fire prone, it's pretty well burned out through there. It's like hit by a suddenly change uh, over the, uh, the last couple of days. So it was uh, quite a harrowing day that day because they thought we were protected, but the suddenly came and popped them. Unfortunately, no one, no one lost their life, thank goodness, but uh, a few properties were uh, da damaged. Um, leave plenty of time to, to leave. Wise emergency service to ensure safety of yourself and others. We will all need to monitor the weather forecast leading into Friday. So you know, keep your eye on the weather, keep your eyes, be alert. The weather will deteriorate early, asking for presence in rural areas, as I said before. To um, if you if you need to get out, just get out. If it makes it a lot less worry, I know you <coughs> I know you're worried about your home. Make sure they're all prepared, as well as prepared as something. Some of the ones I've been to in the last couple of days, this fire's been going for six weeks. Six weeks we've had this, and I'll go to a house today. There's stuff all around it, timber under the decks. You know, take this time tomorrow, especially to clean around your homes, get everything away from your homes. Anything that you think will burn, will burn. Yes? I know you wanted questions at the end, but last time you ran out of water because everyone started watching at 6am. So do you have any guidelines while you talk? We'll come to that, we'll come to that, thank you. Okay, um, so monitor the weather, monitor all forms of uh, official communication, local ABC radio is very good. Let's set up a repeater that's working. Uh, fires near me out, I know it's jittery because you know, internet's a bit out of father since we've lost Mount Wanderer. Um, <coughs> and uh, major fire updates, local social media, and alerts from New South Wales and local authorities. Be prepared to enact your bushfire box of local land. And call triple zero if it's a life threatening situation. We've had multiple triple zero calls and I come out, everything's turned around and it's a small green log about this big and you've got to put a bucket of water on the So we've got plenty of things to do, but now when you're in those situations, you may have to act upon it yourself. There's not a fire truck for every house, there never will be, so you do need to be self sufficient. So without any further ado, I'll put you over to uh, Warren. <coughs> Thanks, thanks to you, got a very good mic here. Um, my name's Warren Sharp. Um, my normal day job is Director of Infrastructure Services at the Bureau of Dallas Fire Council. Uh, I'm currently performing the role of Local Emergency Management Officer, and I'll explain how that fits into the system. But before I do, um, can I say for all the people who have been affected by the fire, um, who have lost their homes and their businesses, um, that we very much feel for you. Unfortunately, we have had two deceased persons in this fire within Europe and uh, three within Vega and three in Charlotte and 20 across the state. Um, we've been out at building some impact assessment teams assessing the areas that have been burnt and many of those areas are it's just devastating to go there. Um, at this stage, these numbers are from those building assessment teams there's 416 houses lost. There are 70 facilities, including businesses, SES shed, school buildings, etc., lost. 630 sheds and other outbuildings 
many of them with valuables in them, also lost. There are 204 houses that are damaged. The extent of that damage is being assessed. I know that one of those properties that's being assessed as not destroyed is um, actually the house of my executive assistant and uh, she's been in that house and it's a very, very bad way. There are 22 other businesses and facilities that are severely damaged and another 191 uh, other buildings that have been damaged as well. And they're only 85% of the way through assessing the areas that they know now to be affected by fire. There's no question that if the predictions the other day, last Saturday, had come true and that fire had moved to the coast in about six or seven hours that it was predicted to do, that the losses would have been very, very large. There are a number of things that we've been doing as a team, as the Emergency Operations Centre supporting the firefighting. So the way it's structured is you have an incident management team that is team that actually looks after the fire itself and is part of that team. Within that team they also have to have, besides the RFS, New South Wales Forestry and also National Parks and Wildlife Service and they engage uh, others in their firefighting and containment strategies including council. We've had lots of our people out there on the front line putting container lines in and many, many local contractors as well. The Emergency Operations Centre sits to the side of that and Chief Inspector Greg Flood was at the back here in the back corner. Uh, Greg is the local emergency operations controller and uh, as the local emergency management officer it's my role to support him. And within that team we have all of the welfare agencies, health agencies, SES, Transport for New South Wales, we've got some wonderful essential energy people here somewhere. Here we are, down the front here. Uh, local land services and a range of other people that are there to basically cover all of the things that are not firefighting but are absolutely essential to keep our community standing up. There's a couple of critical things that we've done to get us in a better shape as, as a child. The first of those, and for a tourist town this is this was not an easy decision, um, was to depopulate the shire of all our visitors. It took a little while for that message to get through, but eventually that occurred, and thank God it did. Um, we were very challenged with no transport options to get people out of the shire, very limited or no fuel, and no power to actually pump the fuel, and many, many, many other things that we had to do to actually get that in action. And we worked very hard over a 48 period to achieve that, and that saw droves and droves of people leave our shire. When the next wave came of fire, our three evacuation centres are typically set up to handle a couple hundred people, uh, and we had more than 9,000 people evacuated. They were the ones who officially registered. We probably had at least half or more of that again on public reserves and other areas around the place. So we did what had to be done, and we were helped by lots and lots of people who chipped in and I thought the description of the centre manager in Maria was probably the most apt that I've heard and that was, we're in a lifeboat, we're not on a cruise ship, we're going to keep you safe, we're going to get you through and you'll be able to go home. <laughs> um, there's lots of different things that have been going on, obviously the Kings Highway has been closed for a while. Um, we've had some absolutely amazing support from Transport for New South Wales. Um, both at a staff level and, and we were lucky enough to have the Minister for Transport as our local member and Andrew has been absolutely fantastic. Um, and our own council crews have done a huge amount of work and it's very risky work actually to get out on those roads and get those trees out. Um, you know I drove through Mogo as the fire was heading up to Mogo the other day and there were still power poles burning for places ready to fall over. Um, there was water spouting out of the ground, there were trees everywhere there were firefighters in there sort of trying to save the primary schools that come through. What we do when we're faced with that situation is we assess as quickly as we can the options to restore connectivity with the Shire. In that particular case, I came back the other way and there were certainly some very severely hit areas, and particularly Rosedale. 
Um, the devastation out there is incredible. Um, but we knew we could stand that road up much faster, and so we, we made that for this neck of the woods, the connecting part of the Princess Highway and also the connection to our local community to stand that back up. And that was a successful operation and we restored the access fairly quickly. Um, there have been, there still are many challenges in the transport network, but the Princess Highway is open north and south of us currently, and so is the Snowy Mountains Highway through. If the fire progresses, as, it's, uh, as it, it will at some point, unless we get very significant rain, it will progress over the Princess Highway again, um, most likely between Maria and anywhere down to the Bamagoo Turnoff. It's already crossed the Princess Highway beyond that point and wiped out Quarma and Cabago as it went through. The current situation with the Kings Highway is that <coughs> we pretty much followed that fire as it went from Durris to uh, Government Bend for all those who know the Clyde Mountain and, and the first big bend, which is called Government Bend. And we followed that along the northern edge of that highway and we were clearing as fast as the fire was moving. And that was a very successful operation for about 20 kilometres. That work basically involved the forestry team first and foremost and let, you know, I've got to take a hat off to those forestry guys. They've been absolutely amazing. And our team has followed them through with an arborist and some of our staff and we inspected those trees on foot so those, that 20 k's was walked and then they selectively chose the trees to be fallen. Some of those trees were very, very large gum trees but just an inch or two holding them up. As the fire progressed over the top of the Clyde, it went down to the valley and then it came back up with speed and ferocity like we've never seen. And the King's Highway is like a war zone. Um, I was up there on the 24th of December and drove through that area and they got the chainsaw to get through. Um, I was pretty glad to get off that highway too. I then flew it three, to three days later and uh, there was a small fire to the south. It looked fairly benign at that stage and people were telling us to get crews up there. That fire that afternoon brought up that hill and back over the top of the Clyde. And so we, we made the right decisions in respect to the Clyde. With the fire that's now advanced, we've now pulled all our council crews and all but one of our contractors back to all our local road network to try and stand the community up that is you know, interconnected between our towns. Transport for New South Wales have been able to move their crews as access to be able to gain from the north back to here and they left them here knowing it would have further impact, which has been fantastic. They are now working on the Clyde Mountain. We hope to restore emergency access in the next couple of days. One of the great challenges with refueling was basically to get semi trailers of petrol and diesel through the middle of the fire ring. Uh, here in Kay, the local uh, trucker here who brings the fuel into this shop, it was just absolutely amazing, as were the police and our counterparts in Shellhaven. So we had three hours of these, one at Shellhaven, one here, at that stage one in Queen Anne. And now we've got one in Bega, one in Snow Monero, and one in Snow Rivers. That's the extension that Victoria's got likewise. Uh, the cooperation across those areas to get police escorts just to get your fuel to fill in your car has just been unbelievable. And that was absolutely critical to depopulating the shop and reducing the risk. But a lot of people took measures, very careful risk assessments. The same said, we don't want to put our people in harm's way just to make sure we could keep this community safe. In terms of um, our approach with the local road network, it's basically most people for least effort and get the most improved connectivity that we can, and that's been achieved in the north. There's still a hell of a lot of work that we've got to go out there to make those roads completely safe. The other area that we've been giving attention to is the urban areas of, that have been burnt because there's a lot of dangerous trees once that fire goes through, and so we are going into those areas and selectively removing what our harvest is considered to be dangerous trees. The other critical role is that some of our rural areas, like uh, Ballara Valley, Buck and Ball Valley, um, the, the fire has ravaged through some of those areas. Um, in the Ballara Valley, there are only two houses left in the fire ship. 
Uh, so, part of our role has been to assist those communities by getting access in. In the case of the Lara Valley, the guy by the name of Keith Dance took his dozer and does from the valley to the tunnel. Um, the people of uh, Narragunda have been severely affected. That village is just about completely wiped out. There's a couple of houses left, a fire shed, and of all the funny things, including what I see, there's a telephone box. <laughs> so, uh, we did go out and see the people who are in that shed yesterday and we provided them with a lot of goods and support uh, last night and again today and we will do that again tomorrow. Um, wildlife, I guess, has been one of the things that's been tragically um, impacted uh, and we've seen some things that I wouldn't put on a camera so they weren't photographed. Uh, but in amongst that, there's blooms of hope. And one of those blooms of hope yesterday was at Narragunda where it was a light that had crossed the road. Uh, there was also a death out of a reef of a black snake when the bridge is not a but there you go. As far as our infrastructure in those areas, uh, can I just say to you, please, please, please don't go west of the highway. Um, we've got residents access, but it's still quite dangerous out there. In the Narragunda, Ballara Valley and other areas, every timber bridge that was under fire is now sitting in the bottom of the river. They've all been burnt to the ground. So the re rebuilding effort is, will be substantial in terms of our transport, but we're giving priority to those that provide most benefit to most people. And we are doing that strategically and we're getting fantastic support. And it was great yesterday when 30, 30 blokes in green uniform turned up and they got an extra couple of taskings to help us out as well. Um, and we do have some out of area gear that we can now able to get into the shire uh, dozers to do some work. Some of that work is going to make our environment look different and uh, even though I'm an engineer and people think we like knocking trees down, uh, we're only going to be knocking the ones that we think we really, really have to knock down. Hopefully our, our bush can be restored to something that's beautiful. Uh, we've got Paul, Major Paul Underwood here from the ADF over here. Paul arrived a couple of nights ago, we're very glad to see him. Um, And Paul is certainly helping us with some things. He's doing some intel for the ADF and we're also putting some proposals to, to government. Those proposals relate to standing this community back up. And I'll come back to those in a minute. I just need to cover off a few um, logistics so that you're aware of some other information. Um, first of all, water. Water in the north of the Shire is perfectly fine. Safe to drink. Um, the question was asked over here was about people utilising water before the fire front comes. And I ask you not to do that. It's been extremely challenging to keep the water in the reservoirs. To the south, Maria South, we're now on a boil water notice. The reason for that is we've had to pump direct from the pool of water that is available to us in the Maria River to keep supply up to, to demand in the south of the Shire. Our field crews, we normally have power, and now power has been restored and certainly helping, uh, we normally operate our system, we can usually operate on one of those phones that you're holding up there, uh, videoing me right now. We can open and shut valves, we can run our uh, water treatment plant, our sewage treatment plant remotely, pretty much. We haven't been able to do that. You know, if you're in a western town, you might have a couple of pump stations that you've got to deal with. We've got 136 school pump stations in this, in this shire, and um, some fairly major water pump stations as well. And just to keep that system running means taking a generator into the wee hours of the day and the night just to give you water and making some strategic decisions about what's the most important series to pump and not pump. And certainly the day of the fire we didn't have anyone out there pumping here to give you the drug when that came through. But uh, those guys have done an amazing job. Our, our road supervisor council have done an amazing job. The, the contractors that work with us have been incredible. Um, so at the moment the point is, unless a fire is bearing down on your property, please don't have the water running out. Uh, in the Tarsal fire, the circumstances we experienced there was that as people left the town, they turned their sprinkler on, they drained the reservoir, there was therefore no water to fight the fire. I encourage you to say that that's not the best strategy. Um, we haven't 
play a strictly enforcing our water restrictions in place because we understand the anxiety that's in the community and that, you know, we're asking people to take a common sense approach with that. Hopefully we'll get some lovely rain at some stage. We certainly hope for that. Power has been a, a massive issue in this fire. You have two very large 132 kV lines and if you get into the nitty gritty questions you'll have to ask our lovely central energy people over here on, on the right. Um, the power energies that you had have been initially from what they call a flashover. So in your house you have a you have a switch that trips your power if it gets a if it gets a, if it finds something that's a bit awkward in the house, it'll flick itself off by and then you've got to go back and flick it off. So it's a bit like that. A um, bit bigger scale, but it is a bit um, Before they put the power back on, what they have to do is fully inspect the entire line from east to end all the way through. And they can't flick that switch until they're done safe to do so, otherwise they can actually create more fire and then quite, cause quite a bit of mischief and damage to their infrastructure as well. Um, a lot of the time that's been by the fire ground. So the delays you're experiencing is basically to keep people safe. We can't put they can't put their people in those spots to be unsafe, and, and nor would we. Um, in some cases, they've been able to get a chopper in the air and fly those lines to do that verification. But in many cases, you can't see. The conditions are such, you can't put a chopper in the air. So I guess one of the key messages in all of this is you've got a lot of good people doing amazing stuff, and they just ask that you be patient with what they're doing. At the moment, we've got power on to all the locations, but on every side arm from those main lines, um, you know, I don't know how I couldn't count the number of power poles I've seen burn off. At Narrag under the, you know, I've come across a transformer yesterday that would normally be on a power pole. There is no sign of the power pole whatsoever. It's as though it didn't exist. Um, so they've got a massive job to stand the power back up, but despite that, they have about 3,000 customers only, when I say only, that's still a lot. But out of the 27,000 customers in our shire, that's an amazing effort. <laughs> the other thing Essential Energy has been helping us with is generators for critical infrastructure or support to VVAC centres. So, how are you going to run a sewage drink plant without a generator? <coughs> Council has quite a bit of generation, but this is just off the in terms of its scale. And they've been absolutely fantastic as there's a constant chasing its extra really large generators to come out of Sydney from Oswald to assist with that. And they've got to be escorted through the fire ground to get here. Um, just on rubbish, there's been a bit of discussion about rubbish. Can I please just ask you to put the three bins out? We will pick them up. There's obviously been a delay in, in the cycle that they've been able to achieve. The contractors back up. The so Surf Beach Tip has been on fire, so we've not been able to take stuff into there. We've got specialists in there yesterday and today trying to get that fire out so that we can bring that back into operation. They're hopeful they might get it today, but fires in tips are particularly difficult because they burn in underneath the ground. Um, but there are some people in there trying to do that work for you. So just put them out, don't co-mingle, just put your, your green waste, your recycling and your rubbish in as you normally would. Um, and you know we had a bit of a few interesting things in behaviour. A lot of people put their waste in the middle of the tomic and roundabout uh, in the last few days. I'm asking you not to do that. That's not actually helping us in this time of uh, quite challenging times. So just hold your waste um, and put it in that bin. Um, a lot of people have been concerned about security of their property, um, and uh, Chief Inspector Clark at the back has brought in. I'm not quite sure what the number is, but a hell of a lot of extra boys in blue, and we're very, very pleased to see them walk into our hall in the last couple of days. They are out there doing lots of uh, uh, patrol, they're doing the normal business of policing, and they're providing great support from the uh, so. Um To our visitors, we know it's hard in a tourism town to be saying to our visitors, don't come or if you're here, leave. But they're actually doing us a favour at the moment not to be. If we had the fire come through from Maria to Bermagui, we will redistribute some of the evacuees to Hang Rock just so we don't have 4,300 people as we did the other day in the river, leisure centre and surrounds. And they will take advantage of the capacity that we're able to generate in the north side. And right at this time, we can't have additional people in the shop. Um, I was
was just talking to a reporter from the Canberra Times and I was giving him a pretty clear message. As soon as this is done, we want all you people from Canberra back down that hill and go and help us stand this community up again. Just in terms of the evacuation centres, um, Hanging Rock, uh, the Marine Showground and the Maroon Leisure Centre. Um, it, it has been challenging, as I said, we've had lots of people support. And we are having a bit of a challenge with the amount of goodwill. We've had some fantastic support from the community, we truly appreciate it, but it's actually causing us a bit of a challenge at the moment. And um, yesterday I was at the VVAC Centre, there was stuff stored in where the toilets and showers were and all that sort of stuff. So we've got the wonderful SDS guys to come in with our own parks team and move all that today. We've got a few more trucks going out to Mackay Park right now. And the Australian Defence Force are going to set us up uh, logistics and supply centre. The supply not only this area but out of area as well. Um, we have turned a few trucks away. We've had offers from all over, yeah, Vic Melbourne, Gold Coast, Brisbane, fantastic support right across other states. Some of those I have said to those truckies, can you please go out and help those poor farmers out in the western New South Wales? Because they're going to need more than we are right now. Um, if you are, are coming into the future, here, you may lose power again, that's a possibility. Um, if you are preparing to go to an evacuation centre, prepare yourself well beforehand. Get your kit of med medical supplies, get, get some extra supplies in there. Then it will charge over to the service station, but just make sure you keep your tank above full. That's been a message I've been giving my staff for some months as we come into summer. Keep your car more than half full, because when you have an event like this, you typically lose power pretty hard to get stuff out. Now we've actually had our spikes go to service stations, find a generator, wire them up and get them going. Uh, after this event's finished, I'll be saying to every service station over in the shire, can you please become self-sufficient? Because that's taken a lot of energy and a lot of organising to actually make that happen. Uh, pets, of course, they are welcome to come to the EVAC Centre. Uh, and we will look after them as well. We've got some fantastic DPI agricultural people and local land services that have been supporting all our people with cattle. We've had cattle and horses and stuff going in all directions at various stages. Not always, there's no one simple message. Maroo Showground is, is our centre for self care, but we've had to utilise whatever we could find, wherever we could find it, to make it work. And they too have done a fantastic job looking after all those animals. Um, touched on briefly um, the recovery process, so Andrew Constance today is with the Deputy PM and he's also with um, a chap called Dick Adams. Dick has been appointed as the Regional Recovery Coordinator. Two weeks ago we had our first recovery meeting, committee meeting in Shellhaven, but the basis and the shape of that has now changed dramatically. Um, and it's great to have Dick on the ground. So even though we're still in response mode, I can assure you that we are very focused on the recovery phase that will follow. Um, we have put proposals up to government to get a much higher level of support. Um, we will advocate for this community very strongly for that support to come. The fundamental thing of going returning to your property and having to deal with how we're going to do get this cleaned up. And in the case of places like Rosedale, have everybody, uh, I guess, receive the support that they need so that everything can happen together. Uh, for mine, it's a very important thing. And we have asked that the government provide support through the Australian Defence Force to assist in that process and remove that burden from those people. Uh, whether we're successful in that bid, time will tell, but I can assure you we are fighting for this community. Finally, um, in relation to community updates, we are providing one of those around about six, 10 o'clock and around about 6 o'clock in the evening. Uh, give or take an hour, so please don't hold us to 10.01. Uh, there's a lot going on. We are waiting on information from a lot of people to feed into that, and we'll try to stick to it as best we can. It is also going onto our website um, and on our Facebook page, and some of the media agencies are just linking to that. But no one's got internet or electricity. How can we get that? I'm getting to that, sir. You just hold your gun, gun powder. Yeah, okay. Yeah, thanks. 
Um, we're also providing that in hard copy on those boards, um, and the, the request that came over here is also a request for receiving. So we are getting that to community notice boards wherever we can. If you've got a preferred location and want to see me after this discussion, we'll try and post it somewhere where it is convenient to you to get those updates as well. We are also providing it to each of the three emergency operation centres as well. Look, I think that's probably all I wanted to cover off in, in this time. Um, uh, just reassure you, as the fire progresses south, our teams are both in front of that. We're doing a lot of proactive work in front of the fire, um, but we also know that as the fire progresses, we're going to have a huge amount of work to do following the fire. Um, we also know that our community is going to need both um, uh, support of the various agencies within government to make things as easy as possible in, in rebuilding our community, and they're also going to need mental support. And that's probably a good intro to introduce Denny to you to come and talk to you a little bit about, about that role. So, thank you very much. Yeah, thanks, Mark. Um, look, I won't take up too much of your time. I did, my name's Danny Burns, and I work as a Rural Resilience Officer with the New South Wales Department of Primary Industries. Uh, our role in that is to link people up with both emotional and financial assistance in times of adversity. And uh, look, there's no one denying that we're in, in, a, in a pretty stressful time at this stage. You know, it's, it's, it's awful what's going on. Um, and in that, you know, I think the most important thing in getting through an event like this is to make sure that we all get through it. And, and the best way to do that is to look after each other. Um, <clears throat> it's so critical that we, that we keep an eye on on your neighbour, your mate, your friend, your sister, your daughter, your, your son, whatever. And don't be frightened of asking questions like, how are you going, you know? If you notice anything different in the way people act, and you know, just just ask the question, you're going okay, mate, it's not that hard. Um, I think women do this a lot better than blokes. Uh, and I think we, you know, us blokes need to knock down some of those barriers. We put ourselves up on it. On a man of peace and say we don't, you know, we don't do that sort of stuff. It's, it's not manly. Well, trust me, it is a manly thing to say to a mate. Are you going okay? So make sure don't be frightened of saying that. You know, um, we need to get through all this together. We need to familiar, familiarise ourselves with some of the websites and, and access lines to mental health services. So there's a whole myriad of services out there like access line. There's, there's just there's a, a lot of different services. Um, over on the, on, the, on the table over here, I've got a whole heap of uh, things called the Glove Box Guide, which have got a good, they're a good um, catalogue of everything that's available in the way mental health services. But make, yourself, make it known, you know, put some of those lines in your phone, it's not that hard to do. So, um, yeah, it's, it's something that's really well worth doing. Um, we're very much in response to this uh, event at the moment. It, it, it's a funny sort of a thing in the fact that you know, some areas are starting to be in recovery, but the rest of it is still very much in response. So, some of the stuff that I'm going to talk about now, the, the information will come out a lot better once we start moving more into response. There will be recovery meetings where there will be lots of information made available in the stuff that I'm going to talk about now. So, there's, there, there's some there's financial assistance that's been made available. Firstly, to small business, there's a, there's low interest loans of up to $130,000 if you've been impacted by the fire. There's also grants up to $15,000 if you've been impacted by the fire. Uh, there's criteria that runs with that. Um, you need to be under 24 staff and, and you need to make your business, like you need to put, well, make 50% or more your income from that business. Um, I have got lots of information about that over here in a guide that's on the, on the table here as well. Um, if you're a farmer, there's, there's plenty of stuff available too. So they're also, they can also access the grant of up to $15,000. There's also some low interest loans available to them, which, which that money can be spent on things like farm, fodder, water, um, things like that. There's also a water infrastructure rebate. So any money that's spent on, on replacing stuff that's been burned in the fire, you know, polypipe, 
water tanks, um, pumps, electricity to pumps, all that sort of diesel in dams, all that sort of stuff. That's all eligible under a rebate scheme. Um, there's also money available to people that have had um, damage done to their house, which can include smoke damage. Um, so there's up to, you know, there's a thousand dollar grants there and up to four hundred dollars for kids. Um, that, that sort of stuff can be, so if you want, if you wanted to access more information around that, for small business and farmers, if you go to the Rural Assistance Authority, if you just Google that, you'll find that all the information there, also hard copies of some of the stuff, I'm not sure if I've got enough for everyone here. If you're after information around the, the disaster grants, if you just, if you look up, um, sorry, disaster assistance, that you'll find your link, a link to, to that um, to that information, but don't feel like that you need to do it today or tomorrow. The, the, the assistance is out there for quite some time. We will run recovery meetings as we move from from um, from response to recovery. Um, we look, we're not far off going into some questions. I just want to make a few more comments. Um, a lot of stuff out there, a lot of people, a lot of stuff being said about who's to blame for all this. Trust me, now's not the time to blame. Now's not the time for finger, finger pointing. Now's the time to dig in with, with each other, help each other, support each other, and let's get through this thing to the end, and then there'll be ample time to have some discussion around, around what's going on and what people think should have been done. Everyone will get an opportunity at some stage to, um, to have some comment about what's going on. So. Uh, lastly, if you've got animals of any sort, we, we really need you to report, if you've been impacted by the fire, we really need you to, to report um, that on our Animal Ag Services hotline. Uh, for those of you that take notes, that number is 1800 814 647. Uh, that's all I've got to say. My name, as I said before, is Danny Burns. And and if I can help at all, um, my number is 0400-374-258. And I'm not going anywhere, but like when these questions finish, I'm more than happy to deal with, with anyone who wants to have a chat. Okay, thank you very much. Okay, questions? Question is, what is described as the main town centre, and if you're living outside the main town centre, Warren? Ian. One, two, three. Um, you've got your urban areas, and then you've got remote areas, probably west of the highway. Um, they're remote areas. Um, some of the, uh, uh, what do you call it? I think smaller acreages, things like that, they're, they're slightly remote to the town. You've got your CBD area in your suburbs, like Catalina and things like that, they're in town, but the remote areas are further west. So you don't want people moving away from the Not necessarily, no. It's your outlying areas. I mean, we all looked at those maps, that, uh, that lovely pocket of Long Beach and does, uh, you know, um, Doris and stuff like that. And that they might be classed as, you know, if you want to, if you're not feeling safe, move out of those areas. Unfortunately, it's probably one of the green patches that's left. So uh, we want to protect as much as we can. There's a gentleman, uh, just hold the gentleman with his hand up. question is, is there any news on basically the communications, the, uh, the internet, etc. Um, you should be able to get internet across your phone service at the moment, I don't know I am. Um, they're working on the telecommunication towers at Wanderer, unfortunately, despite the extensive work that was done around that tower before the fire came through, there was damage up there and they moved some of the, there's two towers. Uh, they moved some of the infrastructure and brought in um, 
interim infrastructure and put it back on the residual tower. So I'm not specifically, don't know specifically, specifically the answer to your direct question, I'm sorry. Um, but like television, we're without, we've been without cricket. Um, so we just have to be patient. Sorry, Belinda, you had a question, Jenny. So the question related to if you want to um, still clean up your property if you're in an area that's as yet unaffected by a fire, um, and effectively you need to clear it up, um, what do you do with your, your, your waste? Um, at this stage, I would encourage you just to rely on the bin service that's available. And if you've got more than that, unfortunately, it would have to go to um, Brow at this stage. That's the nearest available landfill until that new one, until the beach is reopened. Can we get replacement bins that need the bonds? Yeah. Or proof? Yes. Are they available? We are working on getting resupply into the Shire at the moment, so we will do our best to get you a new lot of bins. And that, that is pretty well a universal uh, issue in all the areas directly impacted. Sorry, there's a question over here in the back. Thank you. 
basically doing out in this, this part of the world and, and there was some activity particularly in the south through part of the southern part of the shire for a period there. Um, we are providing if you would just hold one person speaking, one answer. Calling over people is doing us no benefit whatsoever. So look, we take the point. We will take that back to our comms and ABC people. We know they're doing a lot. We're also putting the information ourselves out on the council's website twice a day. As I said before, we're putting in Is there a possibility that you can actually look at some sort of signage or something? I'm from Rosedale, so a large proportion of, of, the, of the homes on the ground in Rosedale now actually are asbestos affected. So it is it is quite a dangerous position that we're sitting in at the moment. Um, so the question related was, um, can they be signposted? So all, pretty much the situation until proven otherwise is that the buildings are considered to have asbestos. Once the assessment is done and the buildings are cleared to be no asbestos, then those buildings are given an all fear. As they're going through, they will be taking properties, they will be treating those properties, and if they believe there's asbestos, they will sign post those. But right now, in the case of, in the middle of this response, if it's a burnt building, you should assume it's asbestos until otherwise known. Okay, we've got um, fire on the, on the edge on the edge of the um, power line, which goes parallel to uh, Fainters Road. 
It's from the Kings Highway right up the coast. Um, there's active fire coming up to the western edge of that. That's now been um, looked after by the RFS. Um, it's, uh, we've, we've put in some backburns and uh, operations over the last couple of days, and they're going to continue to monitor that, monitor that over the next coming days. Uh, there was another spot, couple of spot fires that came into that nursery or that garden centre. Uh, that's all been contained in there, and all the ones on um, the, uh, the southern edge of Clyde Road. So there's still um, active patrols on that. Those fires there I can't say they've been completely contained, but they are being looked after. There's some candles and smoldering logs still in there. Uh, but we, we've been working really, really hard to get those out and uh, preparing ourselves for Friday. Thank you. There's a lady over here, uh, over the back, and, and I would say we're going to have to wind, wind this up in a couple of minutes, but if you do have further questions, we will be available to answer them individually. But the, the people behind me here have got official duties back at the control centre, so you have to respect that at this stage. The question is, what can we expect Friday and Saturday? It's going to be pretty hot and windy on Friday. It's supposed to be westerly winds coming in, and it's going to be, it's going to be in, in the mid-30s on Saturday, on Friday. So um, I don't think it's going to be as, I can't say it's going to be as bad as the other day. A lot of areas are still quite um, black around, but uh, you know, we've just got to be aware of these, this wind might go one amber. It only takes one amber to go out of those contained lines Good, good question. I wish I could answer that. But my, my, my question, my, my, I feel the same. I live in Long Beach as well. I live in Kevin Road. Yeah, so it's, it's in my interest that it doesn't do, trust me. But um, um, I believe we're relatively safe there. But you know, we've got to be vigilant and, and keep mindful of what's going on. As I said, it only takes the other day, it was one spark across the King Tower. And that was it. Okay, nice spark. Lady? question is relating to the, the future, the current and the future in MOGA in terms of communication and transport. Any information, we're an information platform, there's no internet, there's no computers. Yeah, no um, look, we, we did receive contact today, um, direct to um, our man who's in us. Um, I will be heading to MOGA as soon as I leave here just have a bit of a catch up with a few people on that location. We will be talking about what are some of the needs and I'm very happy to catch you for a short period before we leave. Um, obviously some of our communities that are in our more remote area we've had to go out because they've effectively can't, got no current activity, no food, no anything. Um, so we've had to prioritise them and it's difficult um, across the shore. We will come and talk to you today um, and we'll talk about where your needs are, where to from there and what's the best way to actually do that. Okay, we'll take a couple more. One over here. Could I have a similar update for Nelly? Just the, the same question is basically for Mogo um, for communication. There's been a lot of fire, in, a lot of fire impact now again, um, and um, it's probably pretty well black all the way around now again. There's a few little green patches and uh, unburnt ground, but again, my advice is to be vigilant. Yeah, okay, behind you. Is there anyone can give us even a rough estimate of when we might get electricity in Surf Beach west of George Bass Drive, please? I think perhaps... Andy. Andy. It's just an estimate will do. Um, we're having an estimate that we're going to get electricity in Surf Beach and Surf Beach Hi everyone, my name is Raylene, I'm the Community Relations Manager. Yeah. For Central Energy. There has actually been significant damage to the network. We've been unable to get access in many locations due to the risk with active fires and also hazard trees. 
Um, we have been giving, given clearance from RFS recently, so we've got crews on the ground now. We've got 320 um, personnel throughout the state that have been deployed to, to help with the restoration efforts. We don't expect to restore power to many locations until the weekend or even longer into next week. So um, I guess it depends on the area you're in. Keep an eye on our website. We do have um, estimated restoration times there. Um, or come and have a chat with me after. <laughs> okay, I'll take one more after that. Thank you. 